expose you uh, to my knowledge, limited knowledge of it. Um, delighted to be here. I thank the organizers for the invitation and especially for laying on this very English weather, uh, which makes me feel very much at home. Um, this afternoon, our, our session uh, in Corvadis Europa is to talk about uh, European defense after the uh, war in Ukraine. Uh, I think it's a little bit of a misnomer because we don't know when after the war in Ukraine will be, um, and it may be a long time. So I'm going to change unilaterally uh, the title to say uh, European defense in the light of the war in Ukraine, and then we can talk about what comes afterwards as well. Um, my name's Paul Taylor. I'm a columnist with Politico uh, and uh, a senior fellow at Friends of Europe, uh, a think tank in Brussels for whom I've written a series of reports on European security and defense topics, and I'm now working on one on the Western Balkans. Um, uh, in a previous life, I spent 40 years as a foreign correspondent uh, for Reuters, covering war, peace, diplomacy, and a bit of economics. Um, so I'm delighted to be here. I live in France. I have dual French and British citizenship, uh, which uh, is almost the definition of schizophrenia. <laughs> um, Nathalie Loiseau, our distinguished member of the European Parliament, uh, doesn't quite have that problem. She has French citizenship only. Um, although she did once claim that she had a cat called Brexit. And she said she'd named her cat Brexit because it meowed all the time to go out. But when she opened the door for it to, to go out, it stood there looking undecided about whether it wanted to leave or not. And meowed, go, went on meowing anyway. Unfortunately, when the media showed too much interest in the story, Natalie had to admit that the whole thing had been a joke and there was no cat. Um, this is a version of Boris Johnson's dead fish tactic of putting a dead fish on the table to distract attention from other news. Um, Natalie, is, uh, as you probably know, is chair of the European Parliament's Subcommittee on Security and Defence and a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, she's also a member of, on, of the Special Committee on Foreign Election Interference um, in Europe, which is an interesting subject in itself. Um, she was previously Minister of European Affairs in uh, President Macron's government. And, uh, she was, where, when we first met, in fact, she was director of ENA, the French uh, Ecole Nationale d'Administration, Civil Service High Flyers College, uh, which has been abolished or reincarnated under a different name. Um, and before that, she was uh, very active in the French Foreign Service. Um, our other speaker is Jana Pulierin, uh, head of the European Council on Foreign Relations Office in Berlin. And Jana um, has uh, been in that role since 2020. Before that, she headed the Alfred Oppenheimer Center for EU Policy uh, at the German Council on Foreign Relations, the DGAP, uh, which is where I met her when I was researching a report on Germany and European defense. Um, Previously, she was an advisor on disarmament, arms control, and non-proliferation uh, in the German Bundestag in Parliament. Um, and uh, she started her career as a researcher and lecturer uh, at Bonn University in political science, contemporary history, and North American studies. And she's the winner of numerous fellowships uh, and a board member of the German Atlantic Society and of Women in International Security, which I can thoroughly recommend if you don't know it, uh, which is a, a brilliant network of uh, women who are involved in different ways in international security policy and uh, a, a, an outfit with, with which I work as much as I can. So, um, since Russia invaded Ukraine in February, there's been a wave of announcements that suggest 
that Europe is finally getting serious about defence and about defence spending. The European Commission calculates uh, that member states have announced plans for a total of 200 billion of additional defence spending on top of their existing budgets. The EU itself has committed 2.5 billion euros for the first time ever from its own uh, off-budget European peace facility to support the Ukrainian armed forces. And most of that has been to pay for arms transfers from our own member states to Kiev. Um, that was a watershed moment. Another watershed moment was the German Chancellor's uh, foreign policy speech, what's become known as the Zeitenwende, the, the change of era, um, three days into the war, when he announced that Germany was no longer going to be naive about defense, and he notably announced that they were creating a 100 billion off-budget special fund um, to increase uh, defense spending and specifically to buy lots of equipment. And I can tell you, having written a report about it in 2017, uh, how disgraceful the state of the Bundeswehr <laughs> is. You know, that they are, they, they, they don't have boots, some of the soldiers, um, but the helicopters don't fly, the frigates don't sail, um, many of the tanks don't roll, um, and you know, it's, it's, it's a national embarrassment, um, which uh, they had to admit when the war finally erupted in Ukraine. Uh, the head of the German army himself said that he had almost no options to offer to the political leadership. Um, so uh, we also have NATO, which has been uh, very much revived by this conflict. Uh, it has announced uh, plans to boost its high readiness forces in Europe from around 50,000 to 300,000. Um, it has already sent more forward deployed forces to all of the countries of the eastern flank, flank um, including countries such as France, which had previously not taken a leading role there, and now taking a leading role uh, in Romania. So increased uh, presence in the east, uh, increased defense spending, uh, increased uh, readiness, but all of these are, or most of these, are announcements so far, rather than actual new capabilities. Most recently, in May, the European Commission and the High Representative here present announced the creation of a Defence Joint Procurement Task Force to support coordination and deconflict short-term arms procurement and coordinate as a clearinghouse cell for military assistance to Ukraine. And the Commission dangled 500 million euros uh, from the EU budget over the next two years to reinforce the defence industrial capability of Europe through joint procurement. Great idea if it were to happen. Um, the idea is then to have a European defence investment programme established uh, so that we create consortia for European defence capabilities with a, the additional carrot of a value-added tax exemption uh, as an incentive to buy jointly developed collaborative European weapon systems. The question with all this is, will it work? We've been, and I, as, in the, as a veteran in the media covering these things, I've been seeing those same charts for 25 years the charts that show that we have 20 different kinds of tank and track vehicle, we have 14 different kinds of fighter aircraft, we have so many different kinds of helicopter where the United States has, you know, one, two or three. Um, and it's clearly irrational for us to continue like this, but will it change? And that's what we're here to discuss today. Um, and I have to say there are some grounds for skepticism. Um, 
same old, same old. Uh, many, many of these are more announcements than actual spending so far. Where money is being spent, it's partly because our arms and ammunition stockpiles have shrunk as we've provided equipment to Ukraine. So France has given a quarter of all of its César long-range uh, uh, rocket system. Uh, and if you look at the uh, Estonia, I think, has given almost one-third of all of its military equipment to Ukraine out of an understanding of national self-interest that Ukraine is fighting Estonia's war so that it doesn't come to Estonia. But, you know, the money that we'll, we will need to spend just to replace those stocks is considerable. Most of the immediate purchases that have been announced, correct me if I'm wrong, have been of equipment from the United States, not from Europe. Uh, notably Germany buying F-35s uh, and uh, fighter aircraft and uh, a maritime patrol aircraft, the P-8s, and drones. Inflation, which we heard about this morning, is eating into defense budgets, and it's also eating into the announced increases in defense budgets. And it will cost more to borrow money for defense as well, so it's adding to that cost. The German Institute for Economics says now that Germany will never meet NATO's 2% spending target, despite the 100 billion in the defense fund. And some of the money in the defense fund, we're told, is actually being siphoned out of the, defense, the, the permanent defense budget. And things that were supposed to be procured with the defense budget are now being bought with money from the defense fund. So there's a sort of three-card trick going on there. Hütchenspiel, I think you call it in German. Um, and the big-ticket European collaborative defense programs are mostly stuck. The future air combat system is stuck, horribly stuck, in battles among industrialists, in battles between Paris and Berlin, in, Paris, in battles within Berlin with the Budget Committee. Um, there's a rivalry between one system being developed by France, Germany, and Spain, and another system being developed by the UK, Italy, and Sweden. Now, the one thing I can tell you with certainty is that there will not be two European future air combat systems. There will either be one or there will be none. Take your choice. Um, so, we've got a lot to discuss. My questions to Nathalie Loiseau first, and then we'll um, ask, have a couple of rounds of questions uh, with, uh, to them. Um, and then I want to leave plenty of opportunity for you to ask your questions as well. So start preparing your questions now. Um, Natalie, how do we ensure that this big wave of additional European defence spending unleashed by the war in Ukraine is spent rationally in coordination without duplication on capabilities that really are essential for our common defence? Number one. Number two. Is there a risk that we're actually preparing to fight the last war by investing in expensive platforms like fighter aircrafts and tanks that have long development cycles rather than in cheaper and quicker weapons that have proved more effective in Ukraine's defense? Does it matter whether these capabilities are bought off the shelf from the United States and other manufacturers instead of through common procurement from Euro European industries? And if so, how do we ensure that European production is timely and cost efficient given the checkered history of European defense industrial collaboration? Over to you. Uh, thank you, Paul, and thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to participate in, the, in this conversation. 
We heard you, Paul, with your uh, expected skepticism. Um, and of course, if you've been working on European defense for decades, you heard a number of beautiful speeches and not necessarily um, so that many achievements. But there are three elements which may change the uh, mindsets in Europe. The first one is that war has come back to our continent. You may argue that there was already war in the Balkans. Now we see, with no doubt, that Russia has an agenda of aggression using military means to achieve uh, its objectives. Um, it changes the mindsets of uh, the political leaders and political will will be uh, needed at every single step, and I will answer your questions. It also changes public opinions. During the process of the Conference on the Future of Europe, uh, European citizens were asked where, what were their priorities as regards the European Union. And it was striking to see from different parts of Europe the expectations around European defense. Some of these expectations might not be realistic at this point, like a European army, but a sense that we live in a, 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 an unpredictable world with uh, unstable neighborhoods is very strong among our fellow citizens. And they expect the European Union to be able to do more. So we know that we have pressure from more citizens to do more. Uh, we uh, did uh, something we have not done before. We adopted, I would say, the first white book on European defense, which means that we shared our uh, assessment of uh, the threats that, are, uh, that we are facing and the way we should answer these threats. Um, and that's a, a, a step forward because every single member state knows what the others do know. And you have more interest, for instance, for the eastern flank from countries like my home country, France, or Spain, or Portugal, and more interest into Sahel from countries like Estonia or the Czech Republic. So that's a change. But uh, we've talked the talk, we have to walk the walk, and I know too well that beautiful speeches are not always followed by action. On the front of uh, providing uh, military equipments to Ukraine, we have not been that bad. 2.5 billion euros is significant. It was never done before to uh, any of our partners. We decided in a fortnight to uh, provide uh, these equipments. And it's not only that we are um, refurbishing our stockpiles. It's also a, a form of solidarity. You would never have seen Estonia uh, sending uh, the equivalent to one third of its military budget or Poland sending so much military equipment if the European peace facility was not funded massively by uh, uh, member states like France or Germany. So there's already a transfer helping these countries to be able to cope with their generosity and their interest in the war in Ukraine. Um, but yes, we need to have more defense spending. Yes, we need to do more things in common because everything you said is absolutely right. We have spent a lot of money, but in a very divided way with some loopholes and some um, duplications that we have to avoid in the future. How do we do it? The Commission has only some incentives. It doesn't have a real power because defense is still very much in the hands of member states. So we have to convince member states to plan in a coordinated manner. One of the big obstacles that we have been facing for years is the difference in planning of defense spending uh, between member states. You may remember that a former German defense minister, Annegret kramp karrenbauer had mentioned that we should not only have a joint uh, air, uh, combat air system, but also um, a joint um, uh, ship system. And uh, that, that sounded great, that sounded exciting, except that uh, the planning uh, 
of all different uh, navies was completely different. So we have to sit around a table and make sure that uh, we take decisions that are compatible. Uh, this is feasible. We have had the European Defense Agency for, I would say, ages. Uh, now the Commission is trying to have uh, more uh, competences. Uh, and it will be needed at some point, exactly as it was with the uh, absence of health policy before the pandemic, until we realized that we needed to uh, purchase together uh, health equipment or vaccines, uh, member states were challenged to keep the competence of health policies at a national level. And then uh, it was obvious that we were stronger together, that we would buy cheaper and be more effective in a competitive world, uh, and it started working. I think the same is happening in the middle of a crisis. You know the uh, old uh, saying that Europe makes progress in the middle of crisis. That was my fear as we got defense, and I have been repeating for years that if we were waiting for a crisis, it, it meant that we were waiting for a war to happen. Actually, this is what took place. We waited for a war to realize that uh, joint procurement would be needed. It will still be um, a tough uh, fight. We will work on it uh, in the coming weeks and months. The European Parliament will push very much for it so that we are more effective. Um, then the question is, do we buy European, do we have a buy European Act? I would favor it at some point in the future, but we have to face the reality. Some of our military equipment are not ready for that, and we need on-the-shelf equipment. Every single uh, army in the European Union buys from Europe and from outside Europe. It's not a big deal. Uh, but uh, we have to realize that we cannot be dependent forever. It means that on drones we have lost a, a lot of time and we need to speed up. Um, we need to work with the tools we already have, like the European Defense Fund, and it's good that we work on the weapons of the future. You said you were afraid that we would fight the last war, and it's always a fear. For instance, when we worked on the strategic compass, we were very much focusing on the evacuation of our nationals from Kabul and thinking how better to coordinate uh, evacuation, how to be able uh, to uh, control a capital, uh, an airfield, and, and have air transport to be able to uh, evacuate our nationals. What would be the next challenge? I don't know. But, um, other uh, members, other countries and, uh, and competitors or adversaries are making technological progress and we could not be left uh, behind. Look at the money that is being spent in Russia. Look at the money that is being spent in China and uh, look at hypersonic uh, missiles, for instance. It's not because a conventional war is back uh, in Europe that we should forget about all the sorts of warfare that we are all facing at the same moment in space, for instance, or that we should forget about um, freedom of navigation worldwide, which is part of uh, our wealth and our um, well-being uh, in Europe. So we have to be able to confront all these challenges together. It means spend more money, convince public opinions, but they are more or less more convinced than some of political parties, I have to say, um, at least in some countries. I will not comment on, on Germany because uh, the other guests will do it much better that, that, than I do. I don't know if Germany needs to reach the 2%, actually, because when we reach the 2% in France, it includes nuclear deterrence. So have it in mind that 2% of the uh, German GDP might be a lot. And um, if you're speaking about paying the right price and not wasting money, uh, I have spent many years in the United States, especially during the war in Iraq. I am not certain that um, uh, deciding on a level of spending 
is the best way to spend wisely. I'm certain that industrials, businesses love it. I'm certain that uh, it's good for uh, employment in the uh, uh, weapons industry. But it's not always the best way to spend wisely. I'm pretty certain that spending together is a good way to stop wasting money, wasting time, wasting research, and doing more with what we have. Thank you very much, Natalie, for those introductory remarks. I'll come back to you with some more questions afterwards. I, I'm tempted to say that uh, uh, can, we, can, can we be assured that when the war in Ukraine is over, we won't still have the war between Dassault and Airbus? <laughs> oh, well, competition is normal. It's in, the, it's in the DNA of businesses, and I would not blame businesses for being ready to compete. But indeed, there is a need for a political uh, overlook on this sort of industrial projects. Uh, Airbus, Dassault, and all the others are used to have uh, very special customers, which are nation states. These are their customers. Uh, so when we change the rules of the game, when we make it uh, a, a European project, it changes a number of things. And you need time to, to adapt, to adjust. You need political will and you need political follow up. So there will be some drama moments. I have no doubt about it. Uh, but I have no doubt that we will make it, uh, provided that our political leaders do realize that there is a strong need for being uh, committed to these kind of projects. Thank you. I'm going to turn now to Jana Pulierin and ask you basically the same questions, but with a German flavor. <laughs> um, Germany has made very big announcements. Um, it signed some uh, contracts already. But uh, first of all, how real is the Titan vendor in defense? Does Germany have the capacity to absorb all these new weapon systems, to procure them? The procurement system has been a mess for decades. Uh, and secondly, uh, where's Europe in all of this? So far, all I see is Germany buying off the chef shelf American systems, and I'm sure there will be some German systems as well. But I'm missing Europe in all of this. Um, did I miss something? <laughs> Thank you very much for the questions and thank you very much for coming here and listening to us. It's my first time in Santander, I've never been here before and I'm completely struck by the beauty of the nature out there. And so I would prefer to be uh, on the beach, so I admire you greatly that you took the time to come here and listen to us instead. And. Um, to make sure that you don't regret your decision, I hope that we will have an engaged conversation. I'm looking very much forward to your questions and comments and to discussing these things with you because I think this is actually about us, about us Europeans, about all of us. And I want to start with a caveat um, because when I talk about European defense, uh, as it is written in the title, for me that goes beyond the European Union. For me, European defense is about NATO, is about the EU, and uh, is about uh, multilateral cooperation. It is about different member states doing different things together. Um, so all this contributes to European defense, and I think. It is a big shame that in the past we have been looking at kind of European defense mostly in silos. So what NATO does, what the EU does, what the French do with their European intervention initiative, but we have not been able to really um, kind of have all hands on boards and to bring uh, the European power that is available together. So just keep that in mind. When I talk European defense, I not only talk about the EU. And I want to make five points that we can then um, discuss later. I want to put the topic into a broader context. I want to tell you why I'm hopeful, despite everything that Paul has said, but then why I still think um, where we are is not enough and what we do is not sufficient. First thing is, I think that cannot be said enough, um, that traditional war is back in Europe. I mean, just Kind of put yourself in the shoes of a Ukrainian soldier in the Donbass. What you see there 
is a scenario that in Europe you hadn't seen since the Second World War. Kind of two big land armies clashing with battle tanks um, in Europe. Uh, and from a German perspective, it's only two flight hours away, or three flight hours away, depending uh, where you go. Um, so I think I basically, for myself, still have to get used to this idea. Um, because when I was born in 78, and when I grew up, I thought I would see yeah, the world or Europe coming together and not uh, being torn apart again. And this whole hope, and I still remember the Berlin Wall coming down, and I still remember the early 90s. My grandmother is from Poland, so I still remember when Poland um, joined first NATO, and then um, kind of other countries um, of the former um, uh, kind of Soviet bloc joined NATO. Um, and it was a very emotional moment and it was full of hope. And I just recently read the Charter of Paris again and I saw how much hope there really was. Um, so this is all in shadows now. The European security order as we all knew it and as we liked it and as it was very comfortable for us Europeans uh, is in shadows. This is the end of an era. This is the end of the post-89 world and there is not no going back to where we've been previously. Um, even if we wanted to, I think uh, on, on, on Russia's side, they have broken the contract and there is no intention to obey to the, the established rules. Whereas um, there was kind of always hope that the world would go, uh, become better, that Europe would become more and more secure for, for the recent years, I now think we're going into the reverse direction. We need to get used to the fact that we will see more conflict um, maybe even more war, and that this conflict, and that brings me to my second point, will be under the threshold of, um, yeah, maybe um, real war. Um, conflict nowadays is um, also a feature of the cyberspace, information space, energy, as I as a German can tell you, <laughs> is used as a weapon, um, migrants are used as weapons. And this is a new reality and the Europeans need to adapt to it and pretty quickly. Um, and uh, there have been so many speeches talking about wake up calls, but I think this time it's really crucial. I think it's really a make it or break it point. And I make that so clear because I think we need a lot of your support as kind of policymakers, as politicians um, to, to really live up to, to the challenge. The, the world in Europe or the, the kind of the the ordinary life in Europe has become more dangerous, um, more contested, more conflictual um, than previously. And you might not feel it here, but um, you will feel it in the, in the coming month, I'm sure. Um, my third point is, so traditional war is back, um, but there is also a new means of warfare, a weaponization of interdependence. Um, a, a more conflictual order. And the third point is, and that brings me to hopeful things, um, NATO and the United States are back. Um, and I think this is a, ch a game changer, basically, because under the Trump presidency, we all talked about NATO being brain bad, or oh, not we all, but the French president more precisely, um, and basically the end of, of, of NATO and the dysfunctionality. With the Biden administration, um, we've seen uh, the United States come back, and with this crisis we've seen, or with this war, we've seen NATO's come back. But to the tr part of the truth is also that without the United States, NATO would not have been able and will not be able to adapt that quickly. So the truth is that when it comes to how we can defend ourselves as Europeans, today and for the foreseeable future, we cannot do this without the United States. That is because of the nuclear dimension and the US nuclear security guarantees, but also because of critical enablers and other um, capabilities. It's because of um, information sharing and uh, yeah, the US intelligence. So without the US, we would not be able to, uh, or we would not have been able to evacuate even our own people uh, from Afghanistan. And I think we need to take this into account when we talk about doing more as Europeans or a strategic autonomy and all this. 
at the same time well aware that um, the clock in the United States is ticking, we are approaching um, the next elections, forces that brought Trump into power are still prevailing, um, there is a high probability that he will be re-elected. So the US is both uh, indispensable and uh, maybe on the run at the same time, which puts us Europeans in a very difficult position. So I think our strategy here should be talking about buying off the shelf and American to try to um, get the American buy-in to European security as much as this is possible and to contribute to do our fair share, but to prepare for the moment when the United States might be changing um, their security posture. And I think, brings me to my fourth point, the EU is seizing the momentum. Um, Natalie has already um, explained a lot or talked uh, about a lot of things, but I think the, 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 so the sheer fact that the European Union is a civilian power now um, decided to give 2 billion euros uh, to the member states or kind of through the um, European Fees Facility um, so that they can then equip um, Ukraine with European money is really a mental game changer. Um, th that the EU does that um, would not have been possible um, just a couple of years ago. A lot of member states have committed to higher defense spending, including my country, but um, I just learned that uh, in Spain this has been a quite heated debate as well, and that Spain uh, wants to reach the 2% goal by 2029, and that you just have your own little Sondervermögen uh, of 1 billion euros. Um, not comparable with the German Sondervermögen, but still. So, there are a lot of countries that want to join um, uh, the, the club of the 2% spenders. Um, what gives me hope, uh, too, is that we don't only have more money, but that um, kind of the structure of European defence has become much clearer. And I think the strategic compass um, contributes significantly to this, because the EU is in no way trying to duplicate NATO or to compete with NATO when it comes to territorial defence. And I think this is actually very, very good, that it's now much clearer who does what um, and that the idea is more to support each other. And I think the EU can support territorial defense within NATO pretty much through uh, better defense procurement, through kind of European mechanisms enabling the Europeans to get better capabilities, which then can also be used in a NATO framework. That's at least my idea. And I think um, the EU has a tremendous potential to contribute to territorial defense also when it comes to resilience making the EU more resilient, resilient when it comes to all the other sorts of attacks that are not kind of military attacks, but when it comes to information warfare, attack um, uh, on our societies. What also gives me hope is that Finland and Sweden are joining NATO and that Denmark um, is joining um, the EU defense, a CSDP. So that shows me that the two organizations will inevitably be moving closer together and there's this endless debate between uh, Europeanists and Atlanticists um, might, be, uh, yeah, might be less toxic and both camps are much more united. What doesn't give me hope or what worries me is that um, I think we are trying to seize the moment but it's still not enough. I'm afraid of a couple of things. First is a, what I call the reverse 2008 effect. In 2008, when the financial crisis has hit Europe, um, the back then 28 member states decided to cut defense spending individually without cooperation, without coordination, which led to the result that we then had 28 basically bonsai armies, small little armies, um, and um, that kind of we were weakening um, ourselves tremendously. Now the reverse is possible. Every country just spends um, on whatever it thinks it's needed without um, any sort of cooperation. And I think um, that would be wrong and that's why the uh, EU efforts to streamline this are very much welcomed. Um, I think there needs to be a fair balance between off-the-shelf and American products and strengthening the European industrial um, and technological base because it's about knowledge. If we lose the ability to produce um, kind of the um, yeah the weapons uh, of, for the future because we lose the technology the technological knowledge um, we, we we cannot even start to talk about strategic autonomy so I think we need to strengthen um, our industry our uh, knowledge. 
but at the same time, there is uh, a reason behind buying American, because it's about time, because the American equipment is available, um, and it's about filling, uh, refilling the shelves quickly. Um, another thing that worries me is that the experience with the existing European uh, defense projects is so bad. Um, from a German perspective, um, I mean, nobody knows um, how EFCAS um, will end at the moment, doesn't look too good. And I can tell you that when I talk to German parliamentarians, they are, their appetite for future cooperation at this kind of scale um, is rather limited. Um, so, yeah, enthusiasm looks differently. And the other big question um, is if the money is enough. And I think that is... From a German perspective, it's always hard to make this argument. We just decided to dedicate 100 billion euro extra money. But when you look at it a little closer, the money basically is like an ice cube melting in the sun. Um, it seems like a big sum, but actually the 100 billion figure comes from um, kind of a calculation that was done in the Ministry for Defense already in 2018. They were looking at what had Germany promised in NATO, but also in the EU framework, what was necessary, and where were the gaps. And they identified 200 billion euros that Germany needed to spend. 100 um, billion euros through the actual defense um, budget, but then there was this 100 billion euro gap. And that is why that number came up. So the Zeitenwende and what Olaf Scholz announced when it comes to the German uh, Bundeswehr is actually an attempt to arrive in the 21st century, to arrive at 27th February 2022, and to enable Germany to fulfill the commitments that the German government has made years ago in NATO. It is not equipping Germany for the future. It is not, um, I mean, I hope it does both, but that is where the number comes from. When you look at um, when you look at inflation, when you look at um, how much can money creates money. So we buy a lot of new things. Um, we have new personnel, but to maintain this is cost intensive. At the moment, the German plans freeze the ordinary defense budget at the status quo, and also the medium um, kind of defense planning scenario. Um, Kind of doesn't show any um, any change. So it seems like a very big move, but it's not clear how sustainable it is. And here comes the biggest challenge. It's, it's I mean, it's spending the money wisely and for, for the EU, but it's kind of communicating now to the German population that we, in addition to the 100 billion, need a, a rise in the regular defense spending in the long run, because otherwise in 2027, we will be at square one again, um, not spending 2% and not being able to sustain our investments. And this is in times where we have high inflation, high energy prices, where people are struggling, um, and a lot of people ask me, so what, what about kindergartens? What about our infrastructure? Um, what, about, um, what about pensions? What about everything? Is, what, why should we then spend even more money? But I think if you really think a scenario that the United States are leaving, maybe, maybe not leaving, but, but reducing significantly their contribution to European defense, 2% is cheap. And with that, I leave it. Thank you very much. You've given us, put a lot on the table there. And I think given us very good insights into both the context and, and what the German 100 billion means and doesn't mean. Um, and, and I think that's, that's a very useful clarification. I, I want to allow plenty of time for our friends in the room to ask us questions. So let me quickly put a, a two or three more questions to you, if we can do it as quick a question and answer in the second round. Um, one of the things that strikes me watching this is that there's been a coincidence of the war in Ukraine with the demise of Operation Barkhane in Mali. Um, and that the result of that coincidence may be to put all of the focus back on territorial defense in Europe to the detriment of the other security challenges that Europe faces and that require potentially expeditionary warfare operations. Um, and 
and also to put all of the focus back on NATO, which does territorial defense, to the detriment of European or coalition uh, defense operations outside of the NATO area. So that's my first question. My second question, in all of this, we're not really talking about under what circumstances we might actually use any of this equipment that we're buying. So what are the red lines that would trigger a collective European or NATO military response? The use of a nuclear weapon, the use of other weapons of mass destruction, a hybrid operation against an EU or a NATO member state, for example, in the Baltic region. Where's your red line and what, what would you do about it? And my third question, let's take a specific example. If armed conflict were to erupt elsewhere on the continent, let's imagine um, a, a, a new flare-up of political violence in Bosnia-Herzegovina or between Serbia and Kosovo or in Moldova, which institution, the EU or NATO or some other coalition of the willing, should respond and how? I'm going to reverse the order and ask Jana to go first this time, give you, Nat Natalie a bit of thinking pause. So I leave the hard questions to Natalie and um, take the easy one. <laughs> Here, because the question on crisis management, I think, is pretty easy, um, and it's um, it's about um, what is needed in theory and what member states do in practice. So, in theory, or in reality, I would say, um, the United States, regardless who wants, who wins the next American election, um, is going to concentrate um, its efforts much more in the Indo-Pacific and on um, containing China. So what they have uh, kind of in terms of capabilities, but also attention wise for Europe is limited. Now it's all on Ukraine. It's not so much and for, for a while already on uh, other hotspots in Europe's neighborhood. So we should not expect the United States to come to uh, the rescue once there is another crisis in the Middle East or in Africa. Africa is something where the United States pretty much, I think, takes their hands off anyway. And I think if you look at the crises around Europe and if you connect the dots and think the high bread prices or high um, prices for, for everything, but especially um, bread, and think back at the beginning of the uh, Arab Spring, one of the reasons why that happened was because of the bread prices back then uh, in 2011. So the potential for escalation and future conflict in our southern neighborhood is, is growing by the day because of, because of um, the side effects of the war and, and Russia's deliberate attempt to block um, grain exports, but also because of climate change, very much so. And so I think this is a, a, a ticking bomb, and it already had exploded several times. I mean, in Syria, the, the situation is still uh, not, not really great in Libya. And so I think there is a ticking bomb uh, in our southern neighborhood. We try to uh, not think about it too often at the moment, I think, because after Afghanistan and Mali, in, at least in Germany, the idea is, oh, these big military interventions, they failed. Um, they don't have any positive result, and there is some truth to that. So I think we have a growing uh, crisis um, area, and we have not good recipes, what to do. Um, and when it comes to crisis management operations, we have um, the reverse effect. So the, whereas I think the, the need for crisis management in the future is growing, the United States is less available, NATO will be less occupied with crisis management, refocusing um, fully on, on, on territorial defense. Um, we have um, a track record when it comes to missions and operations um, that is not good. Member states, EU missions were much bigger in the past. They were, sh they, they were shrinking in, uh, in recent years and the commitment 
uh, of member states to uh, contribute with personnel uh, and capabilities was really limited. It was always hard to get enough volunteers, um, and that is um, true with regard to civilian missions, but also with uh, regard to military missions. So I think crisis management is something that we have neglected uh, for quite some time, but not because of resources, but also because we lack uh, a good idea how good crisis management operation could look like looking at Afghanistan and Mali not as exact blueprints for success. Thank you. I thought we'd lost you for a moment, Natalie, but you obviously just went to let Brexit out. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was looking for a charger, but you will not get rid of me. Um, <laughs> So I'll try to answer your uh, interesting and challenging questions. The first on expeditionary military forces. Even if we haven't really military forces abroad, there are more training missions or advisory missions. We are not uh, very uh, demanding on, on our military missions right now. You mentioned the coincidence uh, between the war in Ukraine and um, the redeployment of Barkhane from Mali to Niger and other um, countries in Sahel. I would also mention the coincidence with the American withdrawal from Afghanistan, and I'm sure it was a signal that was uh, well taken by Putin that there was very little American appetite to have boots on the ground, uh, not only in Afghanistan, but elsewhere. And we all know that the first signal we got from the US as regards Ukraine was that there would not be uh, militaries uh, in Ukraine, American militaries. Um, but you're right, we have sort of a deficit uh, attention disorder. When we focus on Ukraine, do we realize that we are still busy uh, in Iraq fighting ISIS? ISIS has been uh, mostly defeated, but has not disappeared. And if there were no uh, American and coalition forces there still fighting, alongside with the, the, the Kurds, uh, you would have ISIS remnants coming again and threatening not only the Middle East, but also Europe. Um, Sahel is another example. Libya uh, is a place which will not ask for permission to go back into chaos at any time. And you mentioned the Balkans, uh, and rightly so. Uh, I, I would warn us not to cry wolf at every provocation, because uh, some political leaders in the Balkans are very good at provocations. But so far, it's, uh, 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 and, and rightfully so, it's more political than military, but we have to be ready. Whether it would be NATO or EU, um, uh, I'm thinking of Bosnia, where we have a big uh, and useful uh, military mission, uh, EU Althea. We'll have a challenge with the renewal of the uh, mandate in the uh, UN Security Council. And that's uh, a weapon, a diplomatic weapon for countries like Russia, permanent members of the Security Council, whether they will allow for um, the continuation of the uh, mandate of EU Althea, whether they will put conditions uh, remains to be seen. Optimists will say that they would certainly prefer to have EU um, in um, Bosnia than to have NATO. But uh, realists, as I am, will say that they will probably try to make us dance around the story and see whether they can benefit from something. Uh, the question on the presence of NATO or EU in the Balkans um, is less a about the United States and more about Turkey. And Turkey is an elephant in the room we have not been mentioning. You may remember then when uh, Emmanuel Macron did his famous quote on NATO brand dead, he was of course thinking on the comments made by Donald Trump on NATO. Uh, but he was also thinking about difficulties we were facing between NATO members like Greece and Turkey. And it's not completely over. So this is one more question mark we're having. We are having it in the eastern part of the Mediterranean, but we might have it in the Balkans. And this notion 
that some countries still have, like Russia, but also like Turkey, of spheres of influence, this very old fashioned notion has come back to the table. And we have to keep it in mind when we decide who is in charge and who is doing something. Might also be a condition of the willing. I mean, no matter if the cat, and uh, not Brexit cat, is black or white, it has to catch mice. And that's the most important. And as we have, for the moment, ended up this useless quarrel about uh, Atlantists against Europeans, uh, I think it's not that important. Um, on red lines, well, there are different things in your question, Paul. On nuclear, of course, I will not answer. The importance and the uh, and the use of deterrence is that you never tell what is your red line uh, as long as uh, nuclear uh, deterrence is at stake. You simply say exactly what Vladimir Putin says, um, that if you have existential threats, you might use it. But he also reminded what we all say, that uh, a nuclear war cannot be won, so it could not be um, fought. Um, so no mention of red lines as long as nuclear is concerned, because uh, that's the principle of deterrence. Unconventional, well, Article 5 and Article 42.7. And let's face it, there has been no real conventional threat against any NATO member or EU member since the beginning of uh, the war in Ukraine, which makes me say that our predecessors in 20, maybe not in 28, but certainly in 2014 after Earl Maidan were wrong to keep uh, Ukraine outside of NATO. This notion that the uh, open door policy was the right move uh, is debatable because it was not an open door policy. It was to leave Ukraine at the door. Had Ukraine been in NATO in 2014 after Euromaidan, uh, there would not be a war in Ukraine right now. And as long as hybrid warfare uh, is uh, concerned, well, war has already started. It's not a threat. It's a war that's taking place. Cyber attacks, disinformation, elite capture, corruption of political leaders is something that has been used by Russia for many, many years against the West, against Europe, against the UK, against the US, uh, and we're still in it, and we have to realize it and fight against it, uh, first expose what's taking place. I'm publishing a book in the coming weeks about this invisible war that we are in, but we are already in, and we have to be able to expose it to uh, show solidarity, to use or uh, the means of the European Union, where you have uh, migrants used uh, as a tool or energy or food or whatever. And we have to take countermeasures and not to be shy uh, to name uh, what's taking place and to, um, to respond if necessary. So this is basically my answers. and. Uh, on the Balkans, I think we should uh, focus even more on diplomacy, on uh, uh, conflict prevention. We are doing some things, but we should do more. We should avoid losing our times, for instance, in trying to change the uh, electoral law in Bosnia and focus more on making sure that it's uh, a free and fair election that is taking place and that we deter uh, any ethnic leader to try to destabilize this region, not only, not only thinking that Russia might be behind these leaders and remi remembering that they do that themselves quite a lot of chaos. And uh, it's not outside uh, Europe, it's not in our neighborhood, it's in the center of Europe. Natalie, thank you very much. Well, now it's your turn. Uh, you've been very patient uh, and uh, audience. So it's, it's your chance to throw your questions uh, at the panel. Um, can I see, I'm going to take sort of say three questions at a time, and I'm in favor of positive di discrimination uh, in favor of women because we had only male voices in this morning's questions. So I will give priority to women if there are women hands in the room. Apologies in advance to anybody that that offends. 
So far, I only see male hands. I see, I see a woman hand back there. Can we have a microphone, please? Because uh, the questions, I presume, will be in, in uh, Spanish. Sorry. I've seen the gentleman there. I've got two gentlemen here. And I've got a, a lady in, in the back there. Is there a microphone, please? There is indeed a microphone. Look, Madam, can you stand up so that he can find you with the microphone? Hello, uh, my name is Laura. First of all, thank you so much for being here, for all of the information. And my question is so precise. Uh, but since you mentioned the Balkans and EU or NATO being in Bosnia, like I was curious, you know, what do you think that the Balkans or some countries might prefer to have there? Because it's like NATO bombed Belgrade. But I mean, it's like the EU didn't do that much, at least at the beginning. And they created a conference to try to help, but nothing happened. So when I talk to people from the Balkans, um, they are sometimes like, I don't know, like a bit disappointed at how the EU behave and also how enlargement is going, like how it's low and I don't know. I'm curious to you know what you think. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next question. Uh, well, my name is Annabelle. It's just quite a basic question. Um, I want to know to what extent should we worry about that potential threat of um, like Russia or Belarus attacking any NATO member? I mean, I know it's a bit basic, but I just want to know. Thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as a stupid question. There are only stupid answers. Right. Um, now we can allow one male question, and that I, I recognize the gentleman in the front row. And please feel free to ask your questions in Spanish. Okay. First, I want to apologize because I feel like I'm going to, to talk about divorce in a wedding, but my question is related with Brexit. <laughs> um, concretely about the role of European non-EU non member states in European defence, you think it should be limited to NATO, so the UK should be for us like it, Canada is, for example, or shall the EU be open to special collaboration with the UK or Norway, not only, for example, in f programs like, for example, the Galileo program, which the UK has shown a little bit of interest, at least. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to abuse my privilege of the chair to give you uh, my own answer on that as well, <laughs> as somebody who is Franco-German and therefore totally Franco-British and therefore totally schizophrenic. But uh, the first question, um, Nat Natalie. Yes, yes, thank you for these very good questions. I will start with the Balkans. Um, are people in the Balkans disappointed uh, with the EU? Probably. And for uh, both good and bad reasons. Good reasons uh, because, well, we did a lot uh, to end the war in, in 1995. Uh, we did a lot uh, to provide with uh, subsidies, uh, advice, uh, and with an accession process for at least Serbia and Montenegro. Uh, but it's not going uh, quite uh, fast. That's true. And I have to say that. Um, uh, except Germany, which is making quite a lot of business in the Balkans, and Austria, which has uh, an obvious interest uh, in the Balkans. We don't see that many member states doing things in the Balkans, and they should be much more present. Uh, but uh, the, this disappointment com comes also from bad reasons. Uh, there is an accession process, and it, it is demanding for good reasons. Uh, you have to uh, keep up to, with the European values of rule of law, fight against corruption before you enter the EU. Otherwise, when we face the same sort of problems with members of the EU, like Hungary, for instance, it's much more difficult to address it. 
So yes, the EU is demanding uh, and for good reasons. And that should be a plus for the citizens of the Balkans. And sometimes citizens of the Balkans even blame us for not being demanding enough towards their own leaders, because they see uh, corruption, they see uh, money being captured, and they hope that uh, we ask for um, accountability. And of course, you have this information. You have Russia and also China, uh, and sometimes Turkey or countries from the Middle East, trying to portray EU as a boring partner, always asking for reforms and not providing sufficient support. And then uh, you have third countries coming with loans and wonderful projects and saying, well, just sign uh, at the bottom of the page and you'll see how wonderful the world will be. Uh, and it happened with Montenegro until the moment they were in debt with China uh, to a, a, an indecent level. It happened elsewhere. Uh, you have uh, Chinese uh, workforce working in Serbia with joining uh, working law and not uh, Serbian working law. Uh, so you have all these sort of things. We should be much more present, much more active. We should communicate much better. Uh, and we should believe ourselves much more in the European future of the Balkans because they, they will not change their geography. So uh, better having them within the European Union, better being ready to welcome them. It means that we have to change our governance and making sure that they are ready to join. Not speeding up the process, but making sure that they are continuous progress and it's going in, in the right direction. And as regards bombing of Belgrade and these sort of things, well, this is Russian narrative. They are very happy about it, saying, well, look what NATO did. NATO is not a friend of, of the Serbs or of the Balkans. You will never hear the same thing in Macedonia, for instance. Um, and, uh, well, third countries are, are playing with it. But they show threat of Russia attacking NATO, NATO members. Militarily, uh, well, let's face it, uh, the, the Russian army is not what it was portrayed to be before the war in Ukraine. Uh, it's facing uh, trouble, much more trouble than expected. Uh, and I don't imagine Russia uh, opening a new front elsewhere. But uh, remember what I mentioned about hybrid threat. Uh, is already attacking us with uh, energy, with uh, uh, food, and with disinformation. So we have to face it, and we have to respond about it. And what do we do with uh, European non-EU member states? I'm sure, Paul, you're uh, thrilled to answer the question. Unfortunately, uh, when we signed the uh, political declaration with the UK uh, on Brexit, um, Boris Johnson at the time had included foreign policy and defense among the topics that we would uh, sign an agreement about. And then when we worked on the trade and cooperation agreement, he was, was not interested anymore to have anything substantial with the EU or even with member states separately. I do hope that uh, seeing what has happened with the war in Ukraine, seeing how we are uh, coordinating our efforts, military efforts and efforts on, on sanctions, uh, people, many people in the UK now realize that uh, we are doing a good job and the job could be even better if there was a, a framework for this cooperation in place, because we are still wasting time to adjust to sanction regime from the other side, from the UK to the EU and, and vice versa. And it should be even more effective, especially because the UK is very good at, at sanctions regime. So I do hope that uh, we keep it as uh, something to be done in the near future. Thank you. Uh, Janos, you don't have to answer all of the questions if you think Natalie has addressed them, but please give us your thoughts. Maybe I just concentrate on where I disagree or where I want to add something. Um, on the Western Balkans, I think I understand why there is a lot of frustration. I think the, most of the countries feel like they are stuck in a holding pattern. Um, they are in the waiting room forever. There is no motivation and political will in the EU to let them in. Um, and they feel betrayed. And I completely see that. Um, and looking at, for example, a country like 
Bulgaria, who, held, who holds North Macedonia, I think, hostage um, for internal, like domestic political reasons, um, I can understand all sorts of frustrations. I think we cannot afford to lose the Western Balkans, but I think it's not only about the Western Balkans, it will be also about at least Ukraine and Moldova. It's about enlargement in whenever it will take place in the far distant future and the, the candidate status, but it's how we, for me, it's about how to make the path more attractive for those countries that are waiting to join. And I would think along those lines, um, how to open the single market more to those countries than we already do, um, everything but institutions, um, and how can we even increase our cooperation when it comes to climate and energy cooperation and kind of already think the Western Balkans and think Ukraine and Moldova when we think about um, our energy transformation and the Green Deal and to include them, thinking about them as possible members. Um, second, I completely agree with Natalie on the prospect or the likelihood of an attack on a NATO member. I don't see that coming in the near future. There is this scenario that you very often hear, at least in Germany, kind of if Russia is really pushed to the corner, they will escalate nuclear and they will kind of throw uh, a nuclear weapon just to scare the Western world to death and just to make sure that the West takes um, hands off. I don't think that is very likely, but I would not, I cannot give you 100% certainty that this will never happen. Um, I think it is a scenario that we need to, um, to think about, but I would not think that the probability is, is very high. Um, and on the UK, I think the EU has done a mistake. Um, maybe it was inevitable with this British government, but I was very much in favor of creating more attractive docking mechanisms um, on the EU side. For me, it is basically, look, com coming back to this picture of European defense, fragmented picture of European defense that I alluded to in the beginning. So. The EU is just one player amongst others. There are a lot of coalitions of the willing emerging. Um, some countries have a, a, a huge interest in those coalitions of the willing, much more than um, in working through the institutions because it's time consuming to work in the EU framework. It takes forever. Um, you have to make concessions. Countries like, for example, France um, like to ha uh, work in coalitions of the willing as in the Street of Hormuz or uh, uh, Takuba in Africa. The United Kingdom is very much on board with this because they want to work uh, on a flexible basis with other Europeans. So if the EU is not attractive and is not creating attractive docking me mechanisms, I think you will see more and more of these minilateral, bilateral um, frameworks and I think this will undermine the cohesion of the European Union. That's why I think it's in the EU's interest to have attractive, attractive docking mechanisms. I unfortunately have to admit that this current government in the UK is not interested in anything. Um, I, my bet is on time. Uh, I hope that the United uh, Kingdom will come to its senses, but that the EU will also open up more and, um, uh, when it comes to uh, its precious defence market and cooperation. The UK, just look at what the UK does in Ukraine at the moment. I think we cannot afford to not work as much as possible and wherever it is possible with the UK in every single framework, including in the EU. Well, I, I agree so much with Jana that I probably don't need to add a lot anyway. But let me say, I think it was a, a, a short-sighted mistake by the EU to have made Ga the Galileo project the first issue on which the UK was punished for Brexit. It may have been uh, inevitable because uh, you know, people, divorce is almost the worst uh, moment and the EU itself felt threatened in its existence at the time and therefore had to do something symbolic to show that Brexit had a big, leaving the EU had a high price. But the fact is uh, that this damaged Galileo or, or, or withdrew capability from the Galileo as well as damaging the EU, the, the UK. It created bad blood um, and that bad blood has persisted. Um, I agree with both speakers that under the current British government there's really no prospect. We, the most we can hope is that they stop continuing to dig the hole uh, and therefore we're going to have to wait for a future 
I would say, probably a future non-conservative government, whether it could, it could be a coalition with conservatives, but certainly not a, a, um, a conservative-only government before we can start to rebuild. But what I would really recommend is to stop burning the bridges in the meantime, to keep as many doors open as possible, because the fundamental question which we as Europeans in the EU must ask ourselves is, are we better off with Britain as part of Europe's, Europe's defense, industrial, and techni technological base, or are we better off with the UK drifting off to the American military-industrial complex? And I think that question, as they say in America, is a no-brainer. Um, and a lot of our companies, including defense companies, are still intertwined. Think of uh, MBDA, the missile maker. Think of Airbus. There are so many links that are still there, but which could be broken uh, if, we, if, we, if this divorce goes on and gets worse and worse. So let's, you know, first do no harm or do no more harm. And let's, second, start thinking, planning for the day when we'll be able to do some good. And I have some thoughts on how we could do that. Now, I have another joker to pull out of my chairman's uh, 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 magic top hat, uh, which is that we're going to ask Josep to give us a little, uh, his final thoughts on this conversation. But we've got time for one more round of questions from the floor and answers from our panelists before he does. Uh, so this is your moment. And again, uh, women's hands count double. That's not a woman. I, even I can see you've got a beard, sir. There's a lady here in the front. Hi, um, I'm Elisa. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the proposal of the European Parliament about the uh, 29th uh, article. Uh, about uh, facilitating the sanctions and if you believe it's uh, possible or if it will go forward or it will fail? I think you'll probably need to explain, start by explaining to most of the room what the 29 <laughs> proposal is. Uh, it's a little bit arcane. Thank you for the question. Uh, oh. Other questions? Uh, here, the gentleman in the front and the gentleman to the left, since I see no more ladies, but if I've got you wrong, yeah, and then and then there's some more. Yeah, I've got him. I've got him. Yeah, you and then you. Una pregunta, Natalie, y otra Borrell. One question for Natalie and, and another one to Borrell. Are we in waging a war or not? Is the uh, the expenses military or? I, Natalie, we want to study history and we have to see that one of the causes of the Nazi uh, army was the uh, dispersion of the weapons. Uh, what is important is that these weapons should be European and with uh, European technology, I think. You got it, okay. Right. That was for Natalie. That was, that was for Natalie. So, uh, this gentleman here. No, no, just right next to you. Senor. Senor. Uh, okay. Well, thank you very much. My question is about a recent subject that has been discussed in the European institutions and between precisely Germany, France, and Spain. And it's the Midcat, which uh, Olaf Scholz launched again after uh, three years stopped and there has been an opposition from France and I want to know your opinion about if this is a responsible position in the situation, in the political situation in the whole Europe and if there are any possibilities of developing this project uh, as, the friend, as the German and Spanish government ha are trying in the in the following months. Thank you. I didn't. Sorry, 
Which which program is this? Mitkat, the gasoduct in the Pyrenees oh, the, through. Yeah, okay, the, the, the right, the gasoduct, right? Yeah, okay. Um, not strictly a defence question, but um, we'll we'll we won't let Natalie off for the, that reason. Okay, um, uh, Natalie, go first, please. Well, thank you. Um, on uh, sanctions, uh, the European Union can decide sanctions, uh, including uh, when there are violations of human rights. The very problem we are having today, uh, there are two problems. The first is that to decide sanctions, there is a need for unanimity in the um, among the 27. And you've seen that the more uh, the tougher the sanctions as regards uh, Russia are, the more Hungary is dragging its feet. It's not a surprise, uh, and it's not the first time that one single member state can be a sort of a Trojan horse for a third state which is not willing to be targeted. So there is definitely a need to make a change and uh, get rid of unanimity uh, in foreign politics, especially as regards sanctions. And I would also add that the other problem is that uh, we can target uh, countries um, or individuals uh, for violations of human rights. We should also target them for uh, corruption, because very often both uh, go hand in hand. And that would be a, a useful tool for the uh, European Union. Uh, the second question, uh, better to have weapons in common, because weapons in the hand of a nation state is always something that people uh, fear would bring us back to the horrors of the uh, 20th century. That's right. Uh, but um, you need political will for this, um, which is not always easy. Um, so uh, the European Defense Fund is very helpful to uh, push companies and, and, and member states to work together and making sure that uh, they bring their brains, their means together uh, to have uh, weapons. But at the end of the day, so far, uh, the, 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 the customer, the client, will still remain member states, nation states. So we are not there uh, yet completely. And the last question of on Mikas. Um, I know it's important. Um, I know a country like Spain is very much in favor of it. Uh, and especially in the context of um, getting rid of Russian gas, it might sound um, smart to uh, encourage other gas, or to bring in gas from other parts of the world. But at the same time, you cannot say that it's a green project. We don't only intend to get rid of Russian gas, but we intend to get rid of gas. Uh, and should we invest a huge amount of European money into something that is not green, remains to be seen. So this is at least my personal position. I'm not saying it's the position of my member state, but I'm an MEP. So that's how I see it, and that's how I vote about it in the European Parliament. Not only let's get rid of Russian energy, but let's not forget that we have a target of zero emission in 2050 and that should, we should go green and go, get clean uh, until 2050, before 2050. And this, of course, has nothing to do with French protectionism about protecting EDF and preventing uh, too much uh, uh, energy from being exported across the Pyrenees to, to France, right? So if it was electricity, you know, we, if it was we, electrical we power lot, lines, um, you'd be in uh, favor. Interconnections. There was this position of EDF for years. You're right, but it changed uh, when I was in the government. Actually, we did a summit with Spain and Portugal to enhance the uh, connections between Spain, uh, uh, Portugal, uh, and France. But uh, as regard gas, my position as being uh, maybe sometimes greener than a green is not to lose focus on what we have. And those questions were all um, to Natalie. But I, Natalie, I have a question to you because I'm, I did not um, understand something properly because you talked about sanctions and the need for unanimity. But isn't it the case that once the sanctions regime has been um, established by all 27, you can go to majority voting? There was this um, uh, kind of that proposal already when uh, we talked uh, about sanctions in Belarus, um, this idea that um, one could just do it. And it's more a political question whether 
uh, it's about unanimity. Because, I mean, it would be in an existing sanctions framework, no? Just on the, on, on, but the, there, there would be legal ground for majority vote. Uh, just to understand it better, because that's what I, when I studied majority voting and where and when it's possible, that's what, what my impression was. And if I could add a question, is there any possibility to circumvent Hungary by simply going outside the treaty and doing it by intergovernmental agreement among the other member states because that would really call Hungary's bluff and devalue its veto within the EU. Well, it's always possible, Paul. Uh, you can decide sanctions without being in the framework of the European Union. Uh, but very often, sanction regimes um, uh, have an impact on the functioning of the single market. So you have better uh, to have everybody, everybody on board. And quite often as well, um, you have to compensate uh, the effects of the sanctions uh, towards the member states which are more in a, a, a European framework. Uh, but we had uh, already thought about it when there was this risk that uh, Hungary would veto uh, an additional package of sanctions, whether we would be able to have an intergovernmental system, both of sanctions and of solidarity. This is always feasible, but it's always heavier, let's, let's say it. And to answer your question about uh, does everything has to be uh, decided out of unanimity uh, as regards sanctions, normally no. But the level to which the uh, Political and Security uh, Council Committee of, of the EU is monitoring the implementation of sanctions, as well as the level to which they are monitoring uh, CSDP missions, for instance, is excessive, which means that very often the Council, the 27, want to have their say on every single detail. And I'm sure that if you ask Joseph about it, uh, he will uh, agree with me that uh, as soon as a principle is decided out of unanimity, the rest should be uh, given either to EES or the Commission or to majority uh, voting uh, instead of uh, having this very heavy uh, control of every single small decision uh, which doesn't make us efficient. And to come back to uh, what you were saying before, this is what makes the EU decision-making process unattractive. Thanks very much. We've had a very rich discussion. Thank you, and I apologize to a couple of gentlemen at the back of the room who weren't able to ask their questions. But, uh, ah, okay, Joseph says, <laughs> we're going into extra time. It's injury time at this point. We're not yet in uh, extra time. Uh, so, there are two gentlemen, one there and one on each side of the aisle, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, thank you very much for the very interesting question and discussion. Um, my question is related to finance. Uh, we heard today about the off-budget 2.5 billion of the peace facility, also about the commitment of member states to spend the 2% of the GDP in, in defense, uh, also about joint procurement, uh, but what about our own EU budget? Um, I mean, we have a budget, a new MFF that will be running until 2027, that uh, was clearly designed for the, old, uh, the good old peace times, while now we are facing uh, clearly new um, challenges and, and priorities with an, with an MFF that allocates, if I'm not mistaken, only 13 billion euros to security and defense, being, by the way, the smallest uh, chapter on it. So my question is, and it's I think it's more for, for Natalie. What is the real margin of maneuver of the EU to amend or, 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 or adapt this budget? Thank you. There is, there is of course, a midterm review built in. But um, um, next question, sir. Final question. Thank you very much. Uh, Fabrice Potier from uh, former NATO head of policy planning, now running with uh, Andos for Rasmussen, a consulting firm called uh, Rasmussen Global. And we have been asked by President Zelensky to work on a pro bono basis on uh, thinking through what sort of security defense guarantees 
the international community could offer to Ukraine so that it won't happen again. And that my question is connected to that. I felt the debate today is interesting but very uh, nombrilistic, no, very uh, Europe-centric. Uh, and it, it falls short of uh, answering the key question about all of that for what? And I think some of the, the intervention alluded to that. Uh, all of this Europe and defense to achieve what exactly? And uh, at the core of it is how do we define Europe and security? And I think here, even though there is a broad consensus across Europe that we are no longer in a, in a peacetime uh, uh, state, now we are in a crisis state, in a kind of open-ended crisis state, the question is how do we end it and therefore how do we define Europe and security? And interestingly here, member states are pretty divided. Some define it at the border of Poland. Some defines it actually at the border of Ukraine, the eastern border of Ukraine, and others, including I think still in France, define it in uh, all the way to Vladivostok. And, and answering that question is pretty fundamental, and at the core of it is what kind of support will the international community, especially the Europeans, give to the Ukrainians so that we will not see a third war occurring on Ukrainian soil uh, within the next uh, years or decades. And here, I think there is a key question asked also to the European Defence Project, uh, which is barely playing catch up with the European needs, but actually also has to be able to fill some of the Ukrainian needs, because the assumption, at least we are working on, on behalf of President Zelensky, is the best defense guarantee for Ukraine is self-defense. But the best self-defense is one that is enabled by international donors to a very large extent. Do we have the money and do we have the will for that? Thank you. Thanks very much. Sorry, Fabrice, I, uh, with your beard and, and the distance uh, with my eyesight failing, I hadn't spotted you. Um, the bad news is we've lost uh, Nathalie Loiseau, who regrets she had to uh, cut off because she uh, has another commitment immediately. Um, the good news is I think we've got Josep to uh, try and answer, at least in part, uh, Fabrice's uh, very far-reaching question. Um, as to what the what future security guarantees we can give to uh, Ukraine uh, and uh, uh, and how we uh, uh, develop our, our defense efforts so as to do that. Um, but Jan, I'm going to ask you to have a, a final thought on that before and, and on the previous question. Yeah, first on the EU budget, I couldn't agree more. Um, I was very sad to see that it was cut in, uh, the money for the EDF was cut in half um, in the last budget and the money for uh, military mobility even more so. So, um, yes, um, I think um, there needs to be more money for defence in the EU budget. Um, I think there are a lot of people already making this argument, um, but it's, it is as always when it comes to the EU budget, um, my big fear is that once the war ends, and I don't see that coming in the near term, but I see a scenario where Russia has an interest in a ceasefire, not to create peace, but to refresh uh, its own forces, to regroup, and then to wage an attack maybe uh, later next year in spring again. Um, I, see, um, I see a huge danger that once the security situation in Europe seems to be more stable than it is at the moment and the actual fighting ends, priorities will be different again. Um, I hope they won't. Um, people like I try to, <laughs> I don't know, to, to say at every occasion uh, when talking to the broader public why this is needed, um, but that is my fear. And when it comes to Ukraine, I'm even more pessimistic, Fabrice. Um, I think... Um, I think there is no consensus in NATO what to do with Ukraine. Um, I, th I think um, you have, um, we are nearing a, a European security architecture with three camps, with the West, traditional EU, NATO, um, Russia, um, Belarus, and whoever is in that camp, and then um, a contested um, space in between, like um, it was previously. I think it would be a huge mistake to not do more for Ukraine uh, and Moldova, at least, um, but I, I don't buy it yet. Um, that if you ask me, but not kind of without 
looking at the real situation, I would um, argue for um, what I said before about enlargement, bringing Ukraine and Moldova closer to the single market, um, giving them more access, um, to, uh, doing um, kind of climate and energy projects with them, but also in, at ECF our colleagues have argued for um, security compact with Ukraine, Georgia and Moldova already prior to the war. Um, and I would also be in favor of security guarantees, meaning um, us um, saying clearly, kind of defining red lines and saying if that if X happens, then we do that. But I don't see that emerging. Maybe I'm too pessimistic. Um, the good news is that we had Natalie back. The bad news is we've lost, lost her again. So um, unless she reappears within the next 10 seconds, um, I'm going to pass the floor to Josette. Uh, and as a little filler, I think I would say that uh, I don't think that fundamentally uh, those countries that thought it was a bad idea to, in, to bring Ukraine into NATO before the war have changed their opinion. Um, I don't see any country that has said, I was wrong, we should have brought them in before and now we should bring them in. So I presume that that division will continue and that the security guarantees that can be uh, offered to Ukraine will not be uh, 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 include NATO membership. Or be um, near Article 5. Or, or, but, but, you know, they, they may be uh, as close to Article 5 as you can come from individual countries such as the UK, the US, at least under a Biden administration, but not necessarily under a Republican one. Um, although the Republicans as a party have, have been pretty strong in supporting Ukraine. Uh, during this war. But, but Paul, if the United States wanted to give an Article 5 guarantee to Ukraine, wouldn't they do uh, things differently even, I mean, just now? Um, they say clearly that they have red lines in terms of what they deliver, what kind of weapon systems. They say they are not yep. at yep. war with Russia and they are really careful And they in don't their want approach. World War III, absolutely, right. yeah. I don't see that. No, uh, nor, nor do I, and I think that that, that will remain. Uh, and I must say that my personal view is that NATO made a mistake in, in, in opening the door in the first place to Ukraine uh, and Georgia because they made a promise they couldn't deliver, and that makes NATO look weak and undermines uh, some of its, uh, the trust that people can have in it. Um, and it, it created illusions for those countries. Uh, and led to wars that, uh, in which we were, were unable to come or unwilling to come to their direct defense. Um, but that's my personal view for what it's worth. Um, so we've now come to the pièce de résistance. You're, we're in extra time uh, and we're bringing on our star substitute striker. <laughs> uh, Joseph, the floor is yours. Let Tell us what, what you've taken away from this discussion. Well, I'm, I don't know why everybody started speaking English. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you have to speak English, but all others, it is no more translation from English to, to Spanish to English? Yes, 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 yes. yes it is, no? So make the, make the interpreter to work <laughs> instead of speaking bad English, all of you, no? Your English is no, but, no, no, eh, bueno, para mí este, este well, in fact, uh, for me, this exchange of ideas has been a, a way of uh, seeing what are the views uh, regarding all this uh, uh, things. So we were supposed to be speaking about European defense after the Ukrainian war, but we've talked about almost everything else. We've talked about uh, uh, sanctions. We've talked about what's happening with budgets. We've talked about the red lines and uh, uh, things that are not so much uh, linked to the uh, first idea. And in fact, uh, um, we say after the Ukrainian war, but we don't know if that means after the war is ended or after the war has started. So let's suppose uh, it means uh, after the war has started and there is a war. 
What's so clear to me is that in the last 20 years, the European defense and European armies uh, trying to do something uh, uh, jointly have uh, fundamentally carried out uh, uh, missions uh, abroad. Uh, training missions in Sahel, which is uh, one of the typical examples, or even participations in uh, missions in the uh, NATO framework in Afghanistan. And throughout this time, the European uh, armies have lost a great uh, military capacity. In Europe, we've had a disarmament uh, process, a silent uh, uh, very, but very effective process. The uh, missions uh, abroad, we cannot uh, say were a success. Isn't that true? We cannot say that Afghanistan was a success after $1 trillion spent in uh, I don't know how many years of war. The day we celebrated the anniversary of uh, not being present in Kabul anymore, that's when France decides that they're going to leave uh, Mali. So we cannot say that these emissions have been a success neither in Afghanistan, nor uh, Iraq, nor the Sahel. But when we speak about European defense or the capacity of Europeans of uh, defending themselves through their armies, the uh, public opinion needs to know that the uh, armies uh, um, are now uh, uh, smaller and smaller. And we've talked about bonsai armies, and that is uh, true. They've been uh, reduced in a spectacular manner. It was the uh, chief general of the uh, French state, uh, and France is one of the few countries that has taken seriously uh, defense, and the UK more than anyone else. That's why they're not with us anymore, but uh, those that have taken it more uh, seriously General Bucard in France uh, says to the French MPs uh, things that are quite impressive. For example, he says the number of uh, warships of the French fleet is half of what we had in 1990. So in 30 years, the French uh, fleet has uh, been uh, uh, cut in half. Uh, more than a, uh, a bonsai uh, army, it means that it's uh, really reduced in size. The uh, French army has lost 30% uh, of its uh, uh, combat uh, planes. Uh, that's 30% uh, uh, less. And from the uh, viewpoint of uh, ammunition, stocks are almost uh, finished because of the supplies we've uh, provided to Ukraine. And it's not me saying so, but uh, the uh, general says so uh, before the French MPs in their parliament that we don't have almost no ammunition. We've lost 30% uh, of the um, uh, planes and uh, th uh, half of the uh, ships. If that's not a disarmament uh, process, uh, then what is it? And this is the people that have taken defense more uh, seriously. And for example, in the past, uh, if we ask about what's happened in uh, uh, Germany, Spain, and so on and so forth, the situation is even worse. So that's the issue that Europeans need to reflect on. We now speak about developing military capacities once again. As you know, I am the high representative for uh, foreign affairs and security and defense, and security and uh, defense. Therefore, this is part of my agenda and my portfolio and is one of my uh, concerns. And maybe it's not uh, present enough. Because if we now say that we want to uh, rearm ourselves, that means that we stop the uh, disarmament process and have uh, uh, capabilities again. So there's only two things I have to say to European citizens. First of all, we need to start with the industry. It doesn't make sense to try and have uh, a strategic military autonomy if you don't have military industry. If you don't have the military industry and you need to purchase your weapons from others, then you don't have much autonomy. 
so we need to make an effort to develop a military industry in a joint manner. Airbus has been a big European success and this is something we do uh, between all the different uh, European countries involved. But what we've done uh, for uh, uh, civil aviation and for communication satellite systems is something that we should be able to do so too with military industry. We need to develop the military industry. And I know that people would uh, prefer to develop the industry of uh, cured meat because it always looks better than manufacturing uh, uh, war planes. But if you want to have a defense capacity, you have to develop the industry, but not on a na national uh, foundation. Let's cooperate, uh, cooperate industrially. And that is what the uh, Commissioner uh, Breton will uh, explain because he is in charge of the Fund for Defense. And it should be called the uh, Fund for the Defense Industry because uh, the Commission doesn't have any uh, powers in the defense, but it does have in industry. So these are two very different things, even though they are related. Secondly, if each uh, European state increases its uh, military capacities according uh, to what uh, they have uh, and now they all increase uh, what they have uh, and they uh, broaden their capacities I don't know if I'm explaining uh, themselves in a, a proportionate manner then the result will be a waste of resources a big waste of uh, resources and uh, misuse because we will increase the duplicities that already exist and we won't uh, 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 fulfill uh, what is uh, lacking and uh, the gaps that we have and there's many so we have a lot of many things amongst all but then we also have uh, nothing of other things we don't have refueling for example nor drones uh, we didn't have them in the Libya uh, war, and we still don't have them. So if we just increase what we already have, we won't have what we need. So that's how it works. If you increase only uh, what, and you focus on what you already have, then we won't have what we uh, uh, are lacking. So we need to do together what we don't have, uh, refueling and uh, drones, which is the typical example. And we have... Uh, too much of uh, some of the military capacities and let's uh, please not increase them and uh, reduce them in fact and that's the military architecture uh, operation that we should carry out as uh, uh, Europeans but politically it's very difficult because we're looking into basic aspects of sovereign sovereignty like uh, the organization of armies the kind of army in each uh, country and that someone comes and says you have too many tanks but uh, uh, not enough uh, I don't know uh, uh, ships or whatever mm or the other way around and we need to make an effort so that uh, together we can have an interoperable military capacities that provide us a joint strength so we have 10 bonsais and the 10 bonsais are uh, um, still double the size they will just be double the size but uh, uh, worthless and that's not the solution the solution is to have um, go from several bonsais to having some pine trees. So let's not make the uh, bonsais uh, uh, double in size. We need bigger trees. And this is something very difficult at a political level. Because you have to say to some of them, no, you already have too much of this, you don't, shouldn't uh, manufacture more of this, but more of that. If we all uh, continue working in a disorganized uh, way in the way in which the reduction was carried out because the reduction was also uh, uh, something not organized we all cut in the places where we decided to cut but that's not coherent so if we uh, increase capacities in the same way in which we uh, reduce them or cut them it will be uh, once again uh, worthless and we will spend a lot of money and we will create uh, redundant capacities 
or uh, we will have elements that are useless. And this is something that has to be carried out by the uh, Council of uh, Defense Ministers through the European Defense Agency that every year asks uh, uh, how are European armies, what do they have, what they don't, what uh, should they uh, have. And we try to orient an action that goes uh, through um, submitting uh, national sovereignties uh, to a supranational uh, view. And this, of course, is uh, very uh, difficult. But if uh, we don't uh, uh, do it, we won't know uh, how uh, mm, we're able to progress. That's the political issue. But if the war in Ukraine has been useful, well, it demonstrates that the uh, uh, armies that haven't been very efficient for political uh, reasons, that is another total discussion, don't have the capacities of uh, uh, carrying out a, a war. It doesn't seem that they would uh, be able to do so. This has to be done inside the framework of NATO because I insist on this. There's no alternative for territorial defense of Europe than NATO. And no one uh, pretends uh, uh, for this to be otherwise. But uh, Europeans should have the capacity of uh, joining our forces and making them interoperable so that they can be uh, deployed uh, jointly in missions, so that we can attend uh, problems that NATO is not going to solve. Because NATO is not going to solve absolutely all of our problems. And uh, depending on who is in government in the US, they won't solve any of our problems. You might say, well, you will all have the battle groups and the combat groups that are uh, in standby, uh, why it hasn't worked, why you did not use them, why do you think that your uh, rapid uh, intervention forces are going to be swifter? It is maybe another uh, uh, matter, another issue we can uh, address. Uh, if you have Alpine armed uh, forces, if you go to Congo, you won't do a thing with these forces because they won't be adapted to uh, the, the to Africa. Or if you have a mission, uh, I don't know, with uh, troops to fight in the in Congo, and you have uh, to go to Libya, it won't be the same. So you have to have uh, troops adapted to the terrain, to the missions. Uh, as the uh, military says, it is the mission that uh, determines the force and not the force that is going to determine the mission. So you have to, uh, you, if you have a mission, you have to, to find a force adapted to the mission. Uh, the you need to have uh, the uh, capacity that enables you to adapt the forces to the mission. And that's what uh, uh, we have to do. And that's what the member stated uh, will have to uh, demonstrate they are able to do. So the first uh, uh, answer to the Ukraine war, we will see it very soon when the uh, member state will uh, uh, respond to the uh, petitions of Brussels uh, for having uh, at their disposals uh, the uh, military units uh, uh, that are able to address a certain uh, kind of missions, and some of them uh, will uh, have a relation with the Ukraine war. That's why I'm answering to your question. We are not in war. We are not participating in this war, and I hope we won't be waging that war, because uh, it, we were uh, in that war, it won't be. It wouldn't be a small war, uh, and uh, so I better. I we want. I wouldn't like to imagine the situation tomorrow when we will see the situation of uh, the Ukraine war. You will understand better what I mean by this. 
But Europeans have to understand that they need to have a defense capacity that they, they do not have now currently. And if they want to have them, they have to build them in a coordinated way. And that's the message. I think you have two perhaps unwanted allies. One of them is Vladimir Putin, and the other one is Donald Trump, or the, the, the specter of Dor Donald Trump's return. Um, but I think your biggest problem remains getting the political will of the leaders of our member states to actually bite the bullet, take the tough decisions. I, if I were you, I would try to lock them in a room, perhaps starting with some of the bigger member states that have the biggest defense industries, and, and in, find some way of convincing them that they have to make this a chefsache, as the Germans say. They have to take control themselves. Nobody else can tell the military, no, you've got to have it to the same specifications. No, you've got to have it on the same timetable. No, you can't have extra bells and whistles. One weight of plane, not five weights of planes. One size of helicopter, and these sorts of things. This is what has killed European Defense Corporation in the past. Um, I wish you success. Thank you to Jana. And to Natalie, who sadly had to leave us, thank you for your questions, and I'd like you to join me in thanking the panelists. <laughs>